Rose, and we welcome you as we will be touring and getting to know artist uh, Kurt Steger and see his studio and his artwork. Um, and I would love to tell a little bit about, about Kurt. And I met Kurt, uh, it was in 2011 actually, um, at the Taubman as I was designing and uh, creating Art Venture, our interactive creativity area for children and families. So Kurt and I worked side by side on the sculpture table that that he created for that interactive area, as well as many of you might be familiar with both of those pieces, the huge um, life-size 12 foot in diameter color wheel. And so that was you know, the first um, project that we worked on together, but his interaction in the Roanoke community goes much deeper. So uh, not only is he part of our permanent collection, and he was just one of your sculptures of the Black Madonna was on view in, in a decade, just recently in this past fall. But also, and we'll hear about that a little bit in, in during the tour, is the burden boat and how it is part of the Dr. Robert L.A. Keeley Healing Arts Program. And at that, I would like to recognize the board members that are present here today uh, and that integration. And Kurt Steger's sculptures and architectural constructions address the interdependent relationship between man and his environment. His interest in psychology, shamanism, and the healing properties of art and nature are present throughout his work. Kurt's work includes an environmental indoor sculpture for the City Hall in Sacramento, California from 2005, a public commission to create the traffic circle in Grass Valley, California, 2009, and a performance of the Burden Boat at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. for the 10 year of 9-11 in 2011. He received a New York Foundation Art Grant in 2017. Kurt lives and works in New York's Hudson Valley, where he is developing a site for architecture and sculpture. And with that, welcome Kurt to our Curated Cribs and thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Cindy. This is, uh, it's, it's great to come back to, uh, to Roanoke in this way. And, uh, uh, boy, it's just, uh, it's, it's been a journey. I gotta say that, uh, you know, prior to Roanoke, I, Roanoke area, I was in California, uh, born and raised there and uh, spent most of my life at that point. And then uh, moved from, California to Floyd, Virginia, which was quite a uh, adventure. And, uh, and Floyd was an amazing place to live. And, uh, and the connection to the Floyd community and, um, and Roanoke was really, uh, uh, I, I can say life-changing for me. It was really a, a huge transition in, in my life. And then, uh, and then moving from uh, Floyd, Virginia to Brooklyn, New York uh, was, uh, equally uh, a shock, I love to say. We, uh, or I moved uh, in with Meg Hitchcock, who uh, we married and uh, set up business in, in Brooklyn, in Bushwick at the time. And uh, uh, unbeknownst to me at that time that uh, Bushwick was the, uh, the center of the, uh, of the art scene in, in New York at that time. And we had a framing shop and so met a lot of artists and uh, really, you know, um, transformed my, my outlook on, on art and my process. And uh, it was interesting being a nature-based and environmental-based artist to be living in the city like that. And um, um, I found my way eventually to uh, to bring my concepts into uh, an urban setting, uh, but ultimately it wasn't sustainable to be a sculptor in in New York because um, uh, I'm just not rich enough, and, uh, and it just takes a lot of space to be a sculptor, and space is such a premium in the city. So, um, oh, a little over three years ago, Meg and I. Uh, bought this piece of property uh, about a north, about an hour north of the city, and um, this is uh, where I'm building my dream. You know, I've uh, just finished my studio, uh, started broke ground last July, and finished uh, 
approximately two months ago, I, I moved in. And so it's, uh, it's my dream shop studio. And, uh, and we just converted uh, uh, the other space on the property that was my studio into Meg's dream studio. So she's got her, uh, her dream space as well. And she's, uh, she's just about week two in hers. So uh, we'll do a little tour of, of both the studios and we'll do a little tour of the, uh, of the property and uh, I'll go over a little bit of what I plan to do uh, as we tour around the property. But in essence, I'm uh, wanting to create this into a, uh, a creative space for, for the arts and design. And so architecturally, I'm uh, designing the studio and the landscaping of the property. Um, ultimately, there'll be pathways to sculptures, and I hope to show my work as well as other sculptors' works here. Do some performance pieces here. Uh, uh, have a as a basically a gathering place for uh, uh, artists, like-minded people, people to come and gather and share ideas and be in a uh, an inspiring, nurturing space. And so. Uh, you know, as we go further in the tour, I, I guess I'll talk more about that. Idea. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And, and we'll, we'd love to start with some of your earlier works to show, to show that progression. Great. Great. Ah. <laughs> and I guess I'll talk over these a bit. And uh, this, is, this is Black Madonna. This is the, the piece that is in the permanent collection at the Taubman, which I'm thrilled. And I'm gonna thank uh, Lucy uh, Hazelgrove for that uh, donation. This was part of a solo show I had at Roanoke College, curated by uh, Talia Terrafiero. And, uh, and it, was a, it was a huge uh, uh, solo show for myself. It was, it was a major solo, solo, uh, solo show for me. I mean, it's a huge space to fill. and. Uh, it was uh, a great opportunity to showcase the works that I was building out of uh, in Floyd, which also included the burden boat in this project. Um, so then as I moved up to, uh, uh, this is jumping into uh, Brooklyn, um, I was building these structures. Uh, I was really moved by the, the urban landscape but uh, also connected to my environmental uh, uh, foundation, you know, literally, and uh, in, in this case. So I was building these uh, very geometric structures off of found objects from the, uh, from the urban area. In most of these cases, this is chunks of concrete that I found um, in, in my neighborhood as they're gentrifying the area and uh, areas were being uh, demolished, I would pick up a, a piece of concrete and I would note the address of the space and, uh, and then build a structure off of it. And, uh, in a sense as a uh, kind of a, a landmark or a, a memory of, this, of that space in the, in the past. And Kurt, what, to give us an idea, what is the approximate height oh, of this installation? Yeah, this, this, this piece is, is probably about uh, uh, 30 inches is thirty inches tall. And uh, it is a piece that uh, I would love to do at 30 feet tall and uh, do this out of 410 steel. This one is, is all my, the majority of my works are, are made from wood. And so these are hollow wooden boxes and there's a rust patina is the finish on these, or on this one. Uh, this is uh, also out of that series. And uh, in fact, this one was uh, built from a stone that I carried uh, for years from uh, my property in, in Floyd. And it was a split rock. I'm, I've worked with split rocks in the past and there's a fascination to me that uh, finding a, a split rock, being able to find both halves is just a, um, happens in a moment of, in time because it's not long before those two, uh, two rocks roll away from each other and become uh, two uh, solo rocks. And uh, 
So I held on to these, tied them together, and carried it until I got to. Uh, uh, actually, this piece was built after I moved up here to uh, the Hudson Valley to uh, Lake Peekskill. So, uh, long. Okay, this is part of that series as well. The uh, environmental structures. And um, so in this piece, um, it's a little more extreme of what I was uh, looking at doing is uh, uh, playing with the concept of how man builds on nature and uh, how far are we willing to go and uh, in, in precarious balance with nature before uh, we topple. So uh, this is, uh, this piece, these, these are all in that uh, 24 to, to 30 inch uh, range in, in length or height. Mm -hmm. um, this, is a, this is a part of a series um, I did when um, Meg and I did a house trade, we traded our book, Brooklyn space for a, uh, a bungalow in, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, I was really moved by the modernist architecture out there. And I've always been uh, inspired by Japanese architecture and aesthetic. And, uh, and the modernist has that uh, similar quality. So uh, out in LA, uh, finding these river stones, uh, which were basically landscape stones around uh, the place we're staying. And then again, uh, chunks of concrete. And then this is cast concrete into the uh, into these two found objects. These are these are relatively small. It's uh, about uh, I think these are eight by ten inches, and they are designed to either hang on the wall or be shown on pedestal. Okay, th now this is uh, uh, Marcus Garvey Park. This is in Harlem, and I was invited to uh, create a sculpture in in the park, and. So again, I'm working with this uh, geometric structure built into nature. And, uh, and this was great to uh, do this piece. It's, uh, I think it's around 10 feet by 12 feet, uh, by you know, four or five feet tall. So it's plywood scribed, there we go, scribed to the, the boulder and, and placed in that space. And uh, it really became part of the, uh, the environment there. To, uh, when I first was building it, uh, I was getting a little flack from the uh, locals that, uh, that hang out in the park, uh, drink and play uh, chess there. And uh, once I uh, uh, loaned them my screwed arms, they could open up their grapefruit uh, juice. They could have their grapefruit and vodka. I became part of them. And they said they'd protect this piece from being graffitied. And uh, it lasted a month and a half in the duration of the show. and. Uh, it was, it, was, it was an honor to, uh, to do a piece in, in Harlem. And what year was that? What, what time frame? Well, you know, I'm pretty terrible with years. Um, that would be uh, uh, five years ago. So, um, okay. um, yeah. 2013. 2013, okay. yeah. 13. Thank Thanks, you. Meg. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then. Uh, uh, this is a series I did again. These are found pieces of concrete uh, from our neighborhood in, in Bushwick. And uh, this was actually from our laundry mat that was going to be uh, turned into a luxury condo. And, uh, to, uh, but these pieces are inspired by the trip that uh, Meg and I took to Tibet, which was, uh, uh, it was 2017. And it's, uh, it's very influential in, in my work. Um, I was really drawn by the monasteries that were built into the mountainsides and, uh, you know, the, and how they were connected. You know, that was, it really felt like there was a beauty and uh, uh, sacredness and, and how the architecture was built into the, the, the mountainsides in Tibet. And I wanted to recreate that. So these are you know, my version of uh, sacred spaces uh, uh, built onto industrial or, or found objects. These, these, are, these are small. These are maybe in the 
eight to ten inches uh, range, and um, they're all they're they're hollow, and, uh, and a lot of them under they have objects that I brought back from Tibet, some herbs and stones and things that uh, I imbued the pieces with. Uh, again, part of that series. Um, well, this this piece was uh, this was a uh, piece of cobblestone out of uh, uh, found in our, our neighborhood, and uh, so again, just playing with this modernist, uh, uh, somewhat Asian, somewhat industrial uh, uh, forms you know, built into to found pieces. Again, this is uh, this is part of the Urban Stupa series, a little bit different. This is cast concrete on a piece of found concrete. So similar in how I was building the other pieces where I form a, uh, a, wood, a wood box to the, uh, to the found object, in this case, the concrete. But in this case, then I uh, pour concrete inside that form and in these cases then I would burn the the forms off and that would uh, give the concrete a patina and, uh, and these are all hollow as well it can be uh, light passes through them uh, part of that same series um, and uh, and this is jumping forward to, actually it's jumping backwards in time. Uh, this is a series of my shamanic weapons. Uh, you know, I'm so, so moved in human psychology and behavior. And this was interesting. It was, um, we were getting ready to go to war. We were gonna drop bombs in Syria you know, on Thursday, and this was Monday, and it just, the ridiculousness of that, you know, the absurdity that felt to hear that news really brought something up in me, and it brought this, uh, this warrior energy to say, okay, if we're going to war, I need to, and I'm a builder, I'm a creator, I need to build the weapons for this war, and so that piece on the left, the spiky piece, uh, was the first piece out of that series, and it's, this, it's called a Fierce Club. Um, and I really didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I was really moved, and, uh, and I did this whole series of weapons. I think there's 27 of them in total. And as it turned out, as I sat with these pieces, they, when I realized that these were weapons to fight the ignorance within, that drives us to, to war and violence. And uh, so in Jung's term, the, the, the shadow side, the, the part of us that we don't acknowledge in ourselves. And so we uh, project it out, outward. And uh, so each one of these 27 weapons fights a different aspect of the, uh, the shadow within ourselves. And uh, so these have yet to be fully realized into a show um, oh, the material is, uh, I'll jump into that, paper over, there's uh, basically wood dowels in that that create the spikes. And then at the end of each uh, wood dowel, I tie string and I, and I keep wrapping the string between those dowels and start pulling it tight. And that creates that form. And then there's paper uh, laminated over the top of that. So it's a hollow form. And, uh, and they all are rattles. They, uh, they have objects from Tibet and uh, sacred objects inside. So, um, uh, so like I was saying, the, uh, every, every weapon fights a different uh, aspect inside our, our own psyche. And this is uh, intended to be a performance piece. I have uh, yet to find the, uh, the right uh, venue for it, and uh, and I need a, a good dance uh, troupe to do it. I've had a couple of people dance with them, and it's it's beautiful. Uh, the one on the right is was the last one, so I've got the first and last. The one on the right is a scepter, and that is kind of the shifting from weapon into sacred object, and it's uh, actually a prayer wheel, so that 
uh, uh, section at the top is uh, it spins. And so when this piece uh, is used, that spins and there's uh, again, rattles inside. Um, and I guess the size is obvious from the size of my arm. So, uh, uh, yet to be realized in performance. Oh, here's a couple others. Um, there's a there's a combination. For the most part, they were uh, clubs and knives, and uh, and then shields. And this piece on the left is a shield, very kind of yoni shape. It's you know, it's vulnerable on on the backside. Uh, Facing the, uh, the person in use, and then the uh, the other side is extremely fierce and uh, uh, deadly. And then the one on the right is uh, this hook, and uh, it's taken from the old dragon. So they used to drag the dragons back from the uh, from the battle, but nowadays it drags uh, hedge fund uh, uh, folks back. Into, uh, into reality. So big story around each one. Very uh, powerful. Uh, thank you, thank you. So this, uh, now we're jumping into my latest pieces and uh, see some of these on the video tour as well. Uh, this is what I'm, uh, these were the last pieces I was doing last summer before I uh, broke ground on building my studio. And, uh, and these, uh, now, now I have outdoor space and I'm building an outdoor sculpture garden. And so now I get to build outdoor pieces. And uh, uh, the great thing about this is uh, I can build large pieces. I don't have to worry about storing them. I've got a place for them. So these, these are fairly large. The, uh, the lavender piece is, uh, I think it's about 12 feet long, uh, maybe a little more. Um, uh, the, the blue one, a little bit smaller than that. But um, I've been, struggling for years on uh, making wood sculptures that can survive outdoors. And I feel like I finally have achieved uh, that ability where I'm confident enough that these will have you know, many, many years outdoors. Uh, these have uh, oil pigmented finishes on, uh, something my brother-in-law Doug wanted me to do 20 some odd years ago and I finally got around to doing it. And, uh, and uh, they're, they're built with, uh, Fine joinery, but all the joinery is is angled to uh, uh, let water out and and not get saturated in rot. So uh, these have been wonderful to have in the yard for the last year. And uh, how they change through the seasons, you know, with snow sitting on them, um, rain. Uh, they all they're all on a pivot, so they also turn in the wind. So they they find their own. Uh, equilibrium and wind. So uh, I'm really, I'm thrilled with the, these pieces. Uh, here's a few more. And, uh, and this is, uh, this is Grass Valley, California. It's a traffic circle um, that um, I was commissioned to do as an interesting uh, project. I was living in Floyd at the time and uh, I used to live in Grass Valley and had quite a presence in that city. And they invited me out to uh, uh, make a presentation of a uh, project for this traffic circle. And I flew out from Floyd, Virginia. Uh, I made a presentation. I came out with a model, made the presentation. And they said, yes, you can have this if you can uh, have it done in, I think it was in four months. And I, had, I didn't have any time to go back to Floyd and, <laughs> and gather clothes or anything. So I rented a room. Uh, I still had access to my old studio in Grass Valley and uh, took a hiatus from Floyd, Virginia for four months and, uh, and built this, uh, this piece. And it's based on the architecture. This is an area of the, uh, of the gold mining area of, of California up in the uh, foothills of the Sierras. And so these timbers are built in the same form that they used in the, uh, in the gold mines. These uh, wheels and gears and things, these were taken from the, uh, uh, the mining days. And, um, uh, and embedded into the concrete. And the concrete was actually cast into 
uh, the sand cast the, the sand that the same sand that they cast those uh, uh, gears in that uh, foundry is still operational and they uh, they were great they were thrilled with the project I was doing and they loaned me garbage cans of, of uh, casting sand so I could cast this concrete in it and uh, and these gates uh, or these panels of steel these are uh, symbols of the peoples that uh, uh, I guess for better, lack of a better term were used during the gold mining days you know it's the indigenous peoples uh, the uh, Cornish people, the uh, Chinese people. So basically the, the people that did the work and, uh, 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 and did not receive the wealth of the, uh, of the gold mining days. So it's, it, was, it was a powerful piece and I'm thrilled that it's uh, such a solid piece and it should be in the center of Grass Valley for a very long time. Well, and that's a, that's a good point because as a commissioned work for public art, is really making sure that it can you know, have that endurance over, over time. Is there anything special in terms of finishing like you talked about with the other sculpture that you considered on this or were these materials you know, um, selected so that in terms of long-term um, viability uh, you know, to last? Well, uh, like I said, I've been struggling for uh, a very long time on how to create uh, wood sculptures that can endure the elements. And in this one, uh, obviously the concrete will last hundreds of years and same with the steel. And the wood pieces are just uh, so massive, these, uh, uh, these, these timbers and but even so, the, I, I know from experience, the end grains is the areas where it's going to rot. And so that's sealed and also cut on, on angles to allow the, the wood to drain or the water to drain away from it. Um, the, the base of the, those timbers are up off the ground. So it's actually suspended by the concrete. So it, it'll be a very long time before the wood rots away. I mean, that'll be the first to go, but I'm giving it, you know, couple hundred years and uh, and then and most of the things I build I do you know with wood I do build that it could be repaired and so and, and this piece has a massive foundation underneath it as well so it's uh, I, I think it'll uh, uh, last as long as uh, as people want it to be there and uh, I think it'll be probably destroyed put something else there before it will uh, destroy itself. Okay, this is uh, jumping to the, the burden boat. And um, um, this, was, uh, this was such an important piece for me. Um, I was living in Floyd uh, at the time and I was, uh, I was offered a, a solo show over at Virginia Tech at the Perspectives Gallery. And uh, this wasn't long after the, uh, the shootings at Virginia Tech. And so the community was still reeling from that tragedy. And um, I, I wanted to do something for, to give back. And uh, I wanted to, to create a grieving piece. And that's what uh, inspired this piece. And uh, I was going through a difficult time myself and uh, I was doing a lot of grieving and, uh, and I was making these bags, you know, I was calling them burden bags and that was just a very healing thing for myself. I was filling them with earth and it was really more the act of sewing these bags. So it was very healing for me. It's like a place to put my angst. But anyway, I already had these bags started and then uh, I came up with this theory of this burden boat. So this, uh, the red section is uh, uh, ceramic. And, uh, and the idea of this is that um, during the duration of the show at Perspectives Gallery, I put it out, uh, I worked with through, through the, uh, sorry to miss their name now, it's the organization, it's a nonviolent organization that came out of the shootings uh, on the campus. And the, the man that headed that lost his wife in that, in that tragic day. But I worked with him, I wanted permission to do this on the property. 
So anyhow, during the duration of the show, I invited people to write down their burdens and, and, and place them in the boat. And uh, so it filled up and then we took the, uh, the whole boat out, outdoors on the campus and I had dug a hole in the earth and uh, we placed the burden boat on, on a stand and then did a ceremony and we built, burned the burdens away. And as the fire uh, came up, it would burn through those strings and then the bags fell down into the earth, into that hole in the campus. So that was buried as a memory of uh, not just the people that died that day, but to all the, the grief. So it's it's bearing the grief, but also holding it in in sacred ground. And then the, the burdens were uh, lifted through through smoke and, and released in that way. Um, turned out to be a very powerful project. And uh, so that that piece. Uh, um, went from the Perspectives Gallery, and then I showed it at uh, Roanoke College. Uh, uh, I had it up in Charlottesville, uh, showed it there, and then uh, also at the Smithsonian, the 10 year anniversary of 9-11. And an interesting story, I, you know, then I brought it all the way back to Bushwick when I moved there, and the day I decided that this, I was done with the burden boat and I was gonna let it go. And I was, it was garbage day, I was gonna cut it up and put it in the dumpster. I got a call that morning from uh, Carillion and they said, you know, we would like to buy that piece. And uh, it's like, wow, you, <laughs> you can get it right now, but two hours late, later, it would have been too late. And so that was, a th that was thrilling that, uh, that the piece lives on and, uh, uh, in Roanoke now, and uh, so it's it's a big honor to have that piece. And, uh, oh, and I know it means a lot to to our community. It continues to to you know, have the purpose that you just described um, and that meaningful part for grieving, and has continued um, in you know, in Roanoke. So I'm, I'm I'm glad that that call was made. I am thrilled at the call and, and what really, you know, the, the, the other big thing about this, you know, it used to be mine and I used to do the ceremony and, and, I, and it was really great to let go ownership of it and you know, I, I did the first ceremony at the hospital and then after that, um, you know, the chaplain at the hospital is doing it and I think it's uh, at least a couple times a year and they're telling me that, you know, people are writing their notes there it's you know it's there at the entrance of the hospital and you know when I was there someone came up said you know my my child is you know getting cancer treatments here and while I'm waiting it always helps my heart to uh to be writing down that note and uh putting it in the in the boat so it's it's the greatest gift for me to be able to give this away and uh so it's yeah it's one of my fondest memories of uh well, it's more than a memory of grown up. It's, uh, it's the ongoing energy of that. Exactly. Well, we're got, thank you. And, and there, there we can see you know, the, the burden boot again, and it's been, been a part of, of Carillion Clinic uh, and the arts healing program. We're gonna continue, there's so much to share, uh, um, Kurt. And so we're gonna move through the scribing void and the meltdown in the 330 project. And we'll be then on to, we wanna see the video of the, of the tour of your space because you've talked about the influences of Japanese architecture and looking at creating that space and design for performance and, and your studio and mix. Great, great. Yeah. So scribing the void was scribed to this rock in, uh, in Central Park. And, uh, and then the sculpture was brought to Brooklyn and installed in the exact same orientation that it was created on the stone. Uh, Oh, there, I gotta say there, there was a, um, so that whole scribe line, which was 82 feet around, um, I collaborated with a composer. And so he took that line 
and uh, and scored it to music. And so there is a, uh, I think there was a 18 minute uh, composition made from that line. So basically he composed the song of stone. Played by the Hartford Symphony. We're going to show a video uh, of that. Okay. This is a quick installation view of it. That's one of the favorites when you get to see the behind the scenes of how something is created. So what you won't see in this at the very end, you know, it's, it's up on stilts right now as I build it, but the very end, this is suspended by cables. So the whole piece is floating off the ground and that front corner is about an eighth of an inch off the ground. Like I said, this is in the same orientation, north, south, and uh, uh, in the plumb line of the stone in Central Park. So was, the void is bringing that, that stone that doesn't exist to, to Bushwick. And this piece does exist now and uh, it was, uh, it, was, it went from here in Bushwick to uh, uh, Hartford, Connecticut, it was shown there. And then it was, uh, then it was uh, purchased by Coach Handbags and is in their flagship store in Manhattan at uh, Fifth Avenue and 54th, I believe. So it's, uh, you know, it's, this piece has, is continuing to live on. Congratulations. So that's an opportunity always to see it too, in, in terms of it doesn't, you know, continues to live. And do you usually work with a number of, of people in terms of assistance, helping, especially in big projects like this? Well, I usually don't. I usually do everything solo, but this was really wonderful. Uh, I had uh, two apprentices uh, uh, show up for this, and uh, uh, and they helped me do the scribing. Uh, it was really wonderful. We would just do we would, uh, meet up in, uh, in Central Park with all my little scribe boards, and uh, uh, it was days and days of, of scribing that rock and laying it all out and getting the directions right. And, uh, and it, was, it was really invaluable to have assistance and be able to you know, share my, uh, uh, my skills with them. And that's coming back around. Now I have two wow. young men that are working with me that uh, I'm thrilled to be uh, uh, sharing my, uh, my experience with. That, that's great. And I know that was something that you had talked about is, is being able to, in your new space too, be able to share and have people come and gather. This is a great image to be able to see from, you know, from the outside as you're walking, walking by. And I'm sure, you know, where it's, where it's the permanent home, it's the same thing. Yeah, no, this was a, it was a great gallery to, to be showing that piece. Okay, now we're jumping to uh, uh, Meltdown. Uh, I think we'll uh, you know, do a quick one of these. This is, this is made from uh, gutter water collected in Bushwick that I froze and then uh, had on that contraption. If you can go back one. Uh, yeah, this is, I've got this contraption and this, uh, this pod of ice hangs over the, uh, a turntable with paper on it. And as that uh, contaminated ice drips, melts and drips, it lands on the paper creating a, uh, a, a mark. And it's a, it's a communal piece in the sense that people sit on these benches and just, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Zen meditation. We, we watch the, the drip drop, turn the, the paper, uh, a quarter of an inch, wait for that next drip and the next drip. And it's quite mesmerizing. And, uh, I've had young people sit and watch this and participate for 45 minutes without getting on their phone. So uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, a success. 
Well, we'll move to the, the 330 project then. Okay, yeah, so this is, this is where we are now. So walking out my studio doors, that sculpture sits where I hope to have a pond one day. Mm, beautiful space, Kurt. Thank you. Yeah, the, we've been putting rocks in place, uh, basically dug out the pond and then filled it back in. But all those rocks came out of the hole that we dug. Uh, it's looking towards the house and that boulder there is the reason we bought the property. That uh, I, I love rocks. We had this incredible boulder here. and. Uh, so I built this deck and bench into the boulder. Same idea, it's my sculptures. Um, fire pit. Well, and there's so many elements here for, for gathering. And, and you, know, yes. you, you had talked about kind of that performance element and a place for, for artists and for others, for builders and art and design. So we're going through this gate. Oh. Okay, here's the bench. The deck that was built into the uh, into the stone. Well, and, and tell us about the influences as, as you're looking. I know you mentioned Japanese and modernism. Well, I've been a carpenter uh, all, you know, all my professional life. So we've got 40 years going into it. And uh, uh, I've been a carpenter, a furniture maker, a cabinet maker, um, and, uh, and then and sculptor. So now I, I get to use all those elements on this piece of property to develop it. What I'm calling my style is uh, arts and crafts meets modernism with a Japanese twist. And uh, so it's, you know, I, I get to incorporate my, uh, my sensibilities. And uh, you know, I, I've, there's gonna be a beautiful, I've just built it. I'll be installing it in a couple of days between those two posts, a beautiful screen. And, uh, so uh, it's, it's a fantastic piece of property for me with these large out, uh, rock outcroppings. Uh, it's not a big property. It's just a little bit over half an acre. Um, but, uh, and I'm doing this all on a budget too. So these are found cobblestones and uh, uh, concrete pavers and things that I'm using. Um, that's, this, will, this is Meg's studio. We'll do a quick little tour inside that space uh, towards the end of the tour. And, uh, it's also nice that you know, we're in a neighborhood. So we've got neighbors that are walking by. There's a lake across the street. And so people walk around the lake and uh, we meet our neighbors. And uh, it's, it's great to invite them up on the property. And, uh, well, and, and there was a... You know, a background story on how you really and you know, uh, discovered the property because you were at the bungalow that you mentioned on a trade in LA. Is that correct? Oh, right, right. So while we were in LA uh, with this house trade, uh, we we both work. Meg and I, you know, we're we're artists, so we we work all the time, and so we. Uh, we worked really well up there in LA. So we're kind of isolated on this mountain and it was, it was a beautiful, simple piece of property, but we had coyotes walking through the backyard and, and deer and we loved the, the lifestyle up there. And, uh, and while we were there, uh, Meg started going on Zillow looking to, you know, for properties uh, outside the city. You know, my, my mother had recently passed away and we got a small inheritance, but enough for the first time to have a down payment. So we realized, okay, we can get a few years out of this in, in New York, you know, paying our rent or we can do something with it. And so, you know, I, I drink to mom right now. She was, uh, she allowed us to, uh, 
to get this, this piece of property. So that'll be sculpture pathways down below there. And, uh, uh, and coming up is the first viewing. This is the piers underneath the new studio. And uh, mm. there's uh, the studio. And, uh, so yeah, the, the lifestyle up in uh, LA really uh, spurred this, uh, this idea to move outside the city. And we chose this area because we can, it's a 10 minute drive to the train and then it's a 50 minute uh, train ride down the Hudson River uh, to uh, Grand Central. So we've got great access to the city. It is a beautiful place, and and, it, and you know I can see that that creative space for performance as you had you know talked about that vision for gathering and, and and having people come, which I know you're excited to explore. I really am because it's one thing to do this for myself and to do it for Meg, but uh, you know I really you know I feel so fortunate and filled with gratitude to uh, have this property to to work with and. Uh, um, and to be able to share it is really what's going to uh, make it all worthwhile. And, uh, so, you know, we you are catching it in the winter, you know, which is nice because we've got lots of sky. But uh, in the summer, this place really becomes alive. And I've really gotten into landscaping. And this front deck area, so obviously just plywood now, that's going to be the, the main element of this whole studio project. I'm doing a beautiful Japanese style timber frame on the front of the of the building. Um, that piece right there is uh, that was the companion to Black Madonna. Yeah, it is going back to the earth at this point. And, uh, And coming up, you will do down the side of the studio down below here is what that's going to be a performance area down there, and uh, that'll get some beautiful screen around it. And so, yeah, we're walking and, back into the. And what's your timeline on 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 that? I mean, there's you know it's step by step, like you said, working on on different parts. Yeah, I think we're going to do some uh, events this summer, uh, uh, as long as everything opens up. And uh, but you know, COVID has actually put me, I think, ahead of schedule three years because I've just I've been at home, and right. um, and so it's uh, you know I'm one of those people that have benefited from it, and uh, I've had nothing else to do but work on the studio, and so that is well ahead of schedule. That studio is probably five years ahead of schedule, and uh, I had an angel investor who gave me a loan to do this, and uh, so. Um, and he believes in the project that I'm doing. So um, I think uh, we'll start having performances, uh, in, not this summer, but the following will be up and going. Yeah. Right, keep us posted. Well, yeah. and, the, and the view in your studio is beautiful too, which, um, yeah, you know, you're and, and it's big here. enough, it's big enough to do this pieces that you're working on. Well, this is, yeah, this is the thing is I've got, this is my dream studio after, you know, every studio I've ha ever had, I knew that I would move on. So I can only do so much with it. And so this is my permanent studio. I hope to get 30 years or more out of it. And uh, uh, before I pass it on to somebody and um, it's, um, it's, it's built to, to my specs and my needs and, uh, uh, there's still a little bit more to do. I'm building a loft in it, but it's, uh, uh, I have a hoist. So I will have a hoist in there so I can lift heavy stones and uh, I think it'll accommodate um, anything I can imagine at this point. Well, congratulations. That is fabulous. Thank and thanks for sharing with, with us today, but wow. Thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's a blessing to be able to, to have this to share. So, uh, it's uh, exciting, it's exciting. Yeah. And we have, I believe we have Meg's studio next and then um, to, take a, to take a look. And, and if there are any questions, uh, go ahead and, and type in the chat. I'll weave those in. 
And it's great, like you said, having Meg's studio and your studio on the same, you know, in the same space and in your dream uh, studio for each of you. Uh, yeah, we each, is... we each walk off with our cup of coffee in the morning to our prospective studios. And, uh, and this is Meg's dream studio. You can chime in if you like, Meg. And when we took a peek just the other week, you were uh, full in in construction and in and you know creation. Right. This just came together, and I, I want to say that you know both our studios, all the interior is for the most part uh, uh, leftover material from the building project. So it's uh, you know made of salvaged material for the for the most part. This is Meg's work and. Uh, her work is very sacred. She deserves a whole uh, uh, talk on her own because it's uh, it's very profound work. It's made of sacred texts. You know, she uh, taking texts from Bibles and Qurans, uh, Buddhist texts, and uh, creating these incredible pieces. And now, now she's moving into her new studio. She's uh, She's uh, going back to uh, her love of painting. And so I think we'll see a little uh, shot of her, uh, one of her newest pieces. And she's got a show opening up, boy, I think it's this, this weekend um, in uh, Kent, Connecticut. And, uh, so that's how looking over, that's our lake in the, in the background there. So we uh, have this wintertime lake view. I know we all enjoy the you know, being able to tour the studios, uh, both yours and Meg's, and and very different in terms of the the you know, the tools and the supplies you're using because of the what you're working in. Yeah, I keep thinking I've got the best studio in the world, but then I walk into hers and it's something really special about her mm -hmm. space, so filled with color and, uh, and light. These are her pieces of, uh, I believe these are the illuminated manuscripts. And uh, she's also doing these slings, which stands in for still life, I guess. And, uh, Have you and Meg ever done an exhibition together? You know, we, uh, I think if we, Squeeze in the very last video, you'll see the one and only uh, uh, show we did together, which was here in my studio prior to bringing up the, uh, the tools and uh, the machines. So we did a weekend gallery opening here as a celebration and we showed together. And it is yet to happen in a formal space. And, uh, right. Well, and there, there's a comment from, from Marie that um, maybe most can see, but uh, she works at Carillion. I think you worked with her earlier on and, and just that appreciation of the burden vote. And I agree. I mean, we've, we've seen it. We've heard about you know, being able to have that for the patients and the healthcare workers at Carillion um, during this time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy, I didn't think of that. We have one more video, so we'd love to show, and that's the wheel video. So let's go ahead with that. So this is my studio prior to moving any machines in, and this is uh, the show that Meg and I had together. And why, when we did this showing, it was really difficult to uh, imagine bringing, uh, turning this into a shop because it is a spectacular gallery space. And, uh, so, and it, uh, it just happened to fit this wheel sculpture that I, uh, that I have a very difficult time showing uh, for lack of space. Oh, incredible. Tell us a little bit more about the wheel sculpture as we ran out, round out our hour. Uh, that was a, uh, you know, a, a, that's the third iteration of that, of that wheel. I just, you know, there's something about as a woodworker and a maker, 
yeah, of uh, wood objects. You know, the, the wheel is so primary to what uh, humans have made in the, uh, it's like the basic technology. And so I'm really drawn to uh, that idea of the wheel and the axle of that wheel is a, a branch. It was a tree that was hit in Bushwick and knocked over by a, a truck and I salvaged it. And that curve of the uh, tree uh, creates this momentum uh, when that wheel spins. And so it, uh, it'll, with the slightest push, it'll go for the longest time and then it'll start rocking back and forth. And it's just, it's very mesmerizing. Again, it has that Zen quality of the Meltdown project. And, uh, uh, and it's that, again, the interplay between the man-made and nature. So it's a, it's, it's a favorite piece of mine. Thank you. And I've got a question that came in in terms of kind of that logistical part of a sculptor. So, you know, you've talked about the burden boat, you know, you, it had shown different places and you were getting ready to um, kind of take it to a new place. And you got the call from Carillion Clinic and the other piece that uh, they, um, the scribing the void that then found a new home at Coach and what you know taught you know that what are the pieces like the twenty seven the twenty seven pieces you talked about and showed Spikey and uh, the other ones that you showed us where where are they in the logistical part of the sculptor is the question. Well, that's that's an ongoing issue as a sculptor. So uh, to answer that last question. In the attic, in the basement, uh, uh, shelves in the studio, uh, they, few friends, um, but they, you know, it, it's amazing that the pieces really pack in pretty tight. And that's when one of the great things about this, pro this property that we bought, the, uh, the house had this uh, accessible attic space. And so Meg had her paintings in the attic and I had my, sculptures on one side, she had her work on the other. And now that for the first time, we actually have an abundance of space. We've got an open two car garage, uh, although that's starting to fill up with material pretty quickly. And um, often a lot of my pieces like Scribing the Void, they're, they're, they're built to take apart. And that, that is uh, a consideration when I create pieces. I don't want to be constrained by the realities of storage and whatnot. But at the same time, it comes in to effect. And uh, also I do need to make pieces that I can transport in my van. You know, because I don't wanna be renting a truck every time I want to move the works. And commission work is another thing. You know, and uh, that's, uh, uh, that's built into the, the budget. And, uh, but uh, it's so far, I have yet to be deterred by uh, the idea of storage or space. And, uh, so um, my, my motto with this whole process of being an artist that uh, everything that needs to happen will fall in place if it really needs to happen. And, uh, and if we, uh, Meg and I have talked about it, if she decides to work on huge canvases, we're gonna have to figure something out for her space. But for the moment, we've got all the space that we need and we need more, uh, the, the right uh, opportunity will arise. Thank you, that, that I'm glad to hear there's not, you know, you're not Im imposing any restrictions because that you know, lets, lets you continue to create and find, like you said, it will find its way. Yeah, right, right. So it's really important not to put any constraints on our creative process. That is right. Well, and, and with that, I'll open it up to any other questions uh, for, for Kurt Steger, who's joined us this evening for Curated Cribs at the Talma Museum of Art. It's Kurt, it's so lovely to work with you in the past. And I it's just such a pleasure to have you as part of our Curated Cribs this evening. Likewise, Cindy. Yes, appreciate it.